from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the south. I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Venezuela's President Nicolás Maduro says he is open to dialogue after the attempt coup against his government on Wednesday. Addressing to the Supreme Court, he also announced that the Venezuelan embassy in the U.S. will close this as a response to the constant attacks on his country by the Trump administration. Maduro spoke at the Supreme Court one day after the president of the opposition-controlled National Assembly, Juan Guaidó, proclaimed himself interim president of the country. That two Latin American governments have uh, taken an initiative that I believe must be the road. The dialogue, diplomatic relation, the government of Mexico and the government of Uruguay have proposed to create an international initiative to promote a dialogue of the parties in Venezuela to seek a negotiation, to seek an agreement of national, national peace. I tell the government of Mexico and Uruguay that I agree with this diplomatic agreement for national dialogue in Venezuela. I ready for dialogue, for understanding, for negotiation, for agreement. And I have decided to return the entire diplomatic and consular personnel and close the embassy and all consulates of the United States. An opposition leader, Juan Guaidó, has been accused of violating the Constitution by proclaiming himself as Venezuela's new president. Marilyn Garcia has the story. And the day was just beginning. The Chavista people's chanting encouraged others to spread peace among sisters and brothers. We, the revolutionaries, do not hate anybody. Our heart and our soul is only full with love and with ideological visions. All we need is a free country, for all of us, because we are all human and we all have the right to live in the same territory. As time passed, the Chavista people filled the streets to defend democracy, to defend their vote, and to protest against foreign interference. Then suddenly, Juan Guaido illegally swore himself in as acting president. I swear to formally take all the national executive's abilities as the new acting president of Venezuela. Reactions came swiftly afterwards. Nobody voted for this person. Nobody. They were invited to participate in last election and they didn't want to be there. How do they want to be an authority if they were not even elected? I voted for Maduro. My vote is for Maduro. Who voted for this guy? Who just swore? Nobody. It's a terrible mistake what this kid is doing. That's a joke for us. It's not legit. Our president is Nicolás Maduro Moros. The president of the Supreme Court of Justice has already said that any act of contempt of the National Assembly is invalid. It's not anybody who just wants to be it. It's who earns it, who fights and talks with the people, not a clown that shows his ass and tries to take the piss out of us. The mobilization's final destination was the O'Leary Square, where the president of the National Assembly warned of the ongoing coup d'etat. They have absolutely no shame in violating the constitution that was approved by our people. They know that they can't do that. 
They're trying to do whatever they want. We, on the other hand, are committed to defending our Constitution. This chapter of history was barely beginning. The people walked to the president's palace to meet the Venezuelan president, who called the U.S. interference an irresponsible act that only provoked violence between Venezuelan people. As the constitutional president, I announced to all the free nations of the world that I swore to the Venezuelan people that I would respect the independence, the sovereignty, and the peace of this republic. And that's why I decided to break all diplomatic and political ties with the imperialist government of the United States. Get out of Venezuela. Enough with your interference. And actions have consequences. That's justice's duty. That's already a duty of the Venezuelan justice bodies to act according to the Venezuelan laws. That's already a matter of the justice to preserve the state, democratic order, and Venezuelan law. The Chavista people will stay on the streets to raise their voices and to defend their president, Nicolas Maduro. Meanwhile, the U.S. has requested that the U.N. Security Council hold an extraordinary meeting on Venezuela this Saturday. The Trump administration wants to pressure other nations to recognize self-proclaimed Juan Guaidó as the legitimate president, Venezuelan president. It is expected that the U.S. will also ask for new sanctions against the government of Maduro. A protester interrupted U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo during a meeting of the Organization of American States in Washington. The protesters from the NGO Code Pink accused the U.S. and its allies of supporting a coup in Venezuela. Pompeo was urging Latin American countries to support Guaidó. The situation in Venezuela has been the main topic of discussion at the OAS. The organization's Secretary General Luis Almagro and other U.S. allies support the opposition. However, some member states continue to recognize Venezuela's government. This session is aimed at interfering in the domestic issues of Venezuela, something that goes against this organization, its nature and principles. This room has been transformed into a center for conspiracy against the sovereign nations of Latin America and the Caribbean. On Thursday, CARICOM heads of government reaffirmed the bloc's guiding principles of non-interference and non-intervention in the affairs of states. In an official statement, CARICOM countries say that the political crisis, which has been worsened by recent events, can only be resolved peacefully through meaningful dialogue and diplomacy. They also offer to facilitate dialogue. Cuba's foreign minister has called U.S. actions on Venezuela irresponsible and rejected intervention. Bruno Rodriguez sent his support to Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro and said that U.S. behavior is violating international law. Those actions, Rodriguez said, pose a threat to peace and stability in the entire region. And some U.S. lawmakers are breaking their silence on their government's intervention attempts. U.S. Congresswoman Ilan Omar has said that a United States has backed a coup in the country which will destabilize the region. Congressman Ro Khanna has called U.S. actions as hypocritical. And an, another U.S. Congresswoman, Tulsi Gabbar, say that the people should decide their own future. And still in the United States, people gather in front of the Venezuelan consulate in New York to reject intervention attempts by the U.S. government. Chanting and holding banners, supporters of President Nicolás Maduro rallied to show their support and shouted, hands off Venezuela, to U.S. President Donald Trump. When do we want it? Now! What do we want? USA! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? USA! When do we want it? Now! Ale! A group of Haitians also sent a message and chant for Venezuela and President Nicolás Maduro. Viva Venezuela! Viva Venezuela! Viva Chávez! Viva Chávez! Viva Maduro! Viva Maduro! Viva Haití! Viva Haití! No va a ir a batalla! No va a ir a batalla! No va a ir a batalla!
more stories coming up. We'll be back. Telesur brings you special interviews with social and political personalities. Monday, from Washington. Tuesday, from Mexico. Wednesday, from Caracas. Thursday, from Quito. Friday, from Havana. Analysis about our continent's reality. Weekdays, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Press TV anchor Marche Hashimi issued a message one day after being released from jail. The Iranian-American journalist spent 11 days in jail with no charge. Marche says that she condemns the illegal de detentions by the FBI of black Americans and Muslims and say that the issue goes far beyond her case. I condemn the situation in the United States that individuals can be um, detained, um, arrested without charge. Um, uh, I understand that there's a global demonstration that was already scheduled in conjunction with getting me released. My request is that these uh, demonstrations continue, that we definitely have them because it is not about Marzia Hashimi, it is not about me. It is important to know that this can happen to any person at any time in the United States. These illegal detentions, though they may call it legal. Six days after the Mexican pipeline explosion, the death toll has risen to 100. According to the Mexican Social Security Institute, four wounded people died on early Thursday. The institute said that there are another 11 people who remain hospitalized. The illegal gas pipeline tap exploded in the Mexican state of Hidalgo, killing dozens who were gathering fuel at the moment. Hundreds of Central American migrants have arrived to the Mexican state of Veracruz as they try to reach U.S.-Mexican border. The group stay at a local market temporarily while the authorities set up medical care and food supply for the immigrants. The Mexican Interior Minister said on Wednesday that the country is extending work visas to Central American citizens mainly for Honduras and El Salvador so they can work in Mexico. The goal is to enter the United States, but if that's not possible, then staying on here in a state in Mexico, if asylum is given. We don't want to go back to Honduras. Some of us will stay if we are given asylum. I have a sister in Tijuana, Baja California. She told me not to go there to the U.S., but she will get me a job. My objective for the moment is not to go to the border, but to stay in Coahuila State for two years. I want to go there and work. My objective is to work. The Brazilian government has announced it won't intervene in the investigation of suspicious transactions involving President Jair Bolsonaro's son, Flavio. The Justice Minister, Sergio Moro, well, said we that the probe that is, uh, was in the preliminary stages. Flavio Bolsonaro is being investigated for receiving significant and, uh, cash deposits the, the during his time as Rio de Janeiro state procedures. lawmaker. So they are doing their job. One of Brazil's few openly gay congressman has led the country because of mounting death threats against him. John Willis has also given up his seat in Congress. Willis says he's often targeted by conservative groups on social media for advocating for LGBTI rights. His party colleague, Marielle Franco, was murdered last year. Ecuadorian lawmakers have voted against the presidential veto to reform uh, the reform of the communication law. 
the Commission analyzing the law decided to rati ratify their support for the Article 98 of the media law that promotes the audiovisual industry and national production. Outside of the National Assembly, members of the audiovisual industry rejected the presidential veto as they say it harms the local audiovisual production. <laughs> The presidential veto didn't meet our expectations whatsoever. It's unconstitutional and outrageous. It marks a huge setback to the rights of film and audiovisual workers. Pope Francis has opened the World Youth Day in Panama City. The event has drawn around 200,000 young people from around the world, where the Pope is expected to defend Central American migrants and human rights. The pontiff will spend five days in the country reaching out the young Catholics. Pope Francis said that he regrets the difficulties that Latin American youth will encounter in the future. He said that he especially regrets the plague of femicides and violent hitting the region. Young people find themselves boxed in and lacking opportunities amid highly conflictual situations with no quick solution. Domestic violence, the killing of women, our continent is experiencing a plague in this regard. Armed gangs and criminals, drug trafficking, the sexual exploitation of minors and young people, and so on. Doctors working for the public health care in Guatemala have taken to the streets once again. They are demanding better salaries and are threatening to go on strike. They protested in front of the Congress in the capital of Guatemala. Hundreds of doctors from the public health demanded a salary increase, which was approved in the 2019 state budget. But the government says it won't be able to pay it by the end of January. We are not here to ask, but to demand them to fulfill what the law granted us. Despite the $77 million that the government already assigned to increase the public doctor's salaries, the health ministry said that they will run a national evaluation on the performance of each one of the public health workers before giving them a raise. The doctors say that it is unacceptable. Most of the workers still earn $520 a month. There are colleagues that are professionals in pediatrics, that are chemical biologists. They earn only 4,000 quetzalas a month, and that's unfair for a person that studied really hard. Traditionally, the Guatemalan governments have always abandoned the public health system. It only counts with 6,400 doctors in a country with a population of over 50 million people and with serious health problems. These problems are only treated by two big hospitals in the capital, which give free service to the people. For Latin American standards, we are the worst paid health workers. We've had precarious conditions, but in spite of this, we are giving a quality service to the people. The doctors say they will wait until the end of January for the increase to be effective. If not, they will take to the streets again and begin a general strike. We're taking one last break. Stay with us. to enjoy the cultural diversity that defines our South American essence. Come along to find out the story behind these personalities, traditions, and artistic expressions that unite us as a whole. Real Lives, Friday, only on Telesur.
welcome back. At least 30 people have been killed in the Indonesian island of Sulawesi due to flash floods and landslides. Rescue workers are still working to find dozens who remain missing. More than 3,000 people were evacuated as heavy rains hit the country since last Tuesday. The floods also damaged houses, schools and bridges. It was indeed started from here, but apparently the river back there suddenly overflew. In just about 10 minutes, the water was already 1.5 meter high, so we couldn't anticipate it at all. They are starving there. Kids are asking for milk and food. It is hard to get there. At least two people have been killed and 11 injured when a powerful tornado hit the Turkish coastal city of Antalya. Rescue services are still searching for a 20-year-old university student who went missing after her car was swept into a stream. The tornado also caused extensive damage to property. The Hamas leadership in the occupied Gaza Strip has rejected a financial grant from, a Qatar, from Qatar due to conditions placed by Israel on the funds. The movement said they will not accept the funds as long as they come with conditions. We refuse to receive the third Qatari grant in response to the Israeli occupation's behavior and attempts to evade the agreement brokered by Egypt, the United Nations and Qatar. We hold the Israeli occupation responsible for this delay, this setback and blackmail attempt. The Democratic Republic of Congo's newly sworn in president, Felix Shisikedi, has promised to release all political prisoners. In his inaugural speech, he also pledged to uphold citizen, human and political rights. Shishikeri was declared the winner of a presidential election that was delayed three times. Accordingly, the Minister of Justice will be responsible for identifying all political prisoners of opinion or assimilated throughout the national territory with the aim of releasing them in the near future. Sudanese police have blocked hundreds of anti-government protesters trying to march on the presidential palace in Khartoum. Police fired tear gas at the demonstrators who were urging President Omar al-Bashir to resign. For more than a month, the East African nation has been rocked by deadly protests, triggered by the government's decision to triple the price of bread. And protests are also hitting Spain. Police have clashed with taxi drivers in the capital as they protest enter its fourth day. The taxi drivers have been demonstrating against what they call an unfair competition with taxi applications such as Uber and Cabify. These apps are not subject to the same regulations and taxes as they do. The protests have also resulted in dozens of people arrested and injured. A scene from a South African soap opera caused a social media firestorm in the country this week. Our correspondent in Pretoria, Matubadache, has the story. This scene unearthed the racial tensions that still exist in South Africa 25 years after the end of apartheid. Some viewers threatened to boycott the TV show because of the interracial love scene. Many social media users rallied behind the couple, rejecting the racist statements made against them. Even some influential people in South Africa's media industry took to social media. Even if we can try and forget uh, the apartheid era, that monster did a huge damage to our society. The damage that will live with us till at the end. Well, unless maybe a miracle happens where the memories of segregation and apartheid is miraculously wiped out of our heads. I'm pretty sad that um, that people have caused such an outrage over an interracial kiss on local television. Um, it, just, it just shows you the norms and standards that were set in our lives. Um, that, and people are so afraid to go outside of their bubble and what they were raised to believe. I think South Africa will always have to deal with race issues until we as a country find a way to engage in dialogue, no matter how difficult or how uncomfortable it is. I, I don't believe we've discussed the the most important things i think we are still very 
afraid to offend each other. I think the idea of a rainbow nation has superseded um, the need for honest dialogue and conversation. South Africa's population is only about 2% white, but there are still public spaces dominated by them, some even designed to exclude black people. And so old understandings of race as biology, the material that was delegitimated in the rest of the world in 1948, which then became law in 1948 in South Africa, that has not been undone. Also societies that are fascist usually have a process afterwards of taking away the fascism. So we've seen this in Germany with the denazification program. We've seen some of it in places like Spain where the fascist regime that ruled under Franco, a lot of that was actively undone by post-1982 governments. In South Africa, that hasn't fully happened. 25 years of democracy is evidently not enough for South Africa to achieve social cohesion. The ongoing racial tensions undermine Nelson Mandela's project for reconciliation. Matua Matlachi, Telesur, Pretoria. We come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories in our website at telesurenglish.net. And don't forget to follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.